Hey, Jeremy Hammond here, and in this video, I want to discuss the statement on virus isolation uh, that was put out by Sally uh, Fallon Morell, Dr. Thomas Cowan, and Dr. Andrew Kaufman. Um, so you're probably familiar with, with these names. Um, they are leading propagators of the claim that SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, does not exist. They put out this uh, statement on virus isolation, which essentially summarizes their core position their main argument um, as to the non-existence of viruses, not only SARS-CoV-2. Um, so I just want to have a look at this and we'll go through it. And what I want you to take away from it is how they <clears throat> cite sources that actually don't support the claims that they are making um, and in fact contradict the claims that they're making, which just demonstrates um, their lack of credibility. So here is the statement on virus isolation. Um, you can see here they begin by quoting a dictionary definition uh, of the word isolation, the act of isolating, the fact or condition of being isolated or standing alone, separation from other things or persons, solitariness. So when scientists speak of um, isolation of viruses, what they mean is that they isolate the virus from the patient. They separate the, the virus from the patient. Um, they do this using cell culture. So here, textbook uh, description of the isolation of viruses. Uh, here's a summary. Viruses are obligate intracellular parasites and thus are propagated using living cells in the form of cultured cells, embryonated hen's eggs, or laboratory animals. Culture has long been considered the gold standard for viral, di viral diagnosis because it secures an isolate for further analysis, is more open-minded than methods that target single agents, uh, and allows the unexpected or even novel agent to be recovered. So that's a description of isolation. As you can see, the use of cell culture is actually considered the gold standard of virus isolation. Here's another description of isolation of viruses that basically explains the same thing. Unlike bacteria, many of which can be grown on an artificial nutrient, nutrient medium, viruses require a living host cell for replication. Infected host cells can be cultured and grown, and then the growth medium can be harvested as a source of the virus. So when scientists speak of virus isolation, this is what they're talking about. So effectively, um, the argument that's made by um, Kaufman et al. is that uh, it's not isolation because you're putting the virus in a cell culture, therefore it's not separated from everything else, um, as though scientists had the capability of suspending viruses in a vacuum for observation. Um, so es essentially what they're doing is they're dismissing what scientists mean when they describe virus isolation in favor of a layperson's dictionary definition interpretation uh, of, the, of the meaning of the word isolation. Um, so that, that's, that's the core argument. Uh, and, and then to try to support their argument that virus has never been, been isolated, um, they, they make a number of claims. So let's just go into what they describe as the proper way to isolate a, a virus. Now, of course, when they describe the proper way, um, you know, they're, they're, this is a claim of authority here. They're saying that they know the proper way to, to do it, um, and they're going to cite literature to, to support that claim that they know the proper way, that there is a proper way described in the scientific literature to isolate a new virus, which is curious because you, you can go into the less scientific literature and you can see that the proper way, you know, the, the, the preferred method, the gold standard method is cell culture, and yet they're saying that that's not the proper way and they're going to try to cite scientific literature to demonstrate that what they describe is the proper way. So let's see how they go about doing that. So, um, so they say, uh, without mixing these samples, uh, well, let's let's back up. So uh, in, just read this whole paragraph here. In as concise terms as possible, here's the proper way to isolate, characterize, and demonstrate a new virus. First, one takes samples uh, from many people with symptoms which are unique and specific enough to characterize an illness. Okay, well, scientists have done that, right? Then, without mixing these samples with any tissue, or products that also contain genetic material, the viro virologist macerates, filters, and ultracentrifuges, i.e. purifies, the specimen. This common virology technique done for decades to isolate bacteriophages 
and so-called giant viruses in every virology lab, then allows the virologist to demonstrate with electron microscopy thousands of identically sized shaped and shaped particles. These particles are the isolated and purified virus. Okay, they cite a source there. They have a footnote, um, so endnote one, uh, to support their description of the proper way to isolate, um, which they deny that the use of culture is a proper way to isolate. Um, so again, so uh, the, the, the key claim here is that without mixing these samples with any tissue or products, um, th they do it that way without without <laughs> uh, without combining it with anything else, right? Without mixing it with any products that also contain genetic material. Um, so let's just look at their look at their um, their source. So they cite here this article. Um, from PLOS 1, published uh, April 25th, 2019, Isolation, Characterization, and Analysis of Bacteriophages from the Halo Alkaline Lake Alimentita in Kenya. Um, and so all we have to do is examine what did they do? What did they do in this study? So here I have a downloaded copy, um, and I'm not going to go through and read all these highlights. Um, but, but essentially, just kind of summarize, uh, he, I'll read the first part here. Viruses that infect bacteria, called bacteriophages, commonly referred to as phages, are known to exist in essentially every po possible niche where bacteria reside, and profoundly influence ecosystems by infecting and subsequently killing their hosts, they are impacting the cycling of carbon and nutrients. So bacteriophage is a virus that infects bacteria cells. So here we can see that, um, ca contrary to their broad claim that viruses don't exist, they actually do acknowledge according to their statement of virus isolation, which cites this paper as a th being authoritative, uh, that viruses do exist. At least viruses that can infect bacteria exist um, by Kaufman and Cowan's own implicit uh, acknowledgement. Um, so that's point one. So if viruses that infect bacteria exist, why should we disbelieve in the existence of viruses that infect plants um, or animal species or humans? It seems logical to, to believe that, well, viruses can infect numerous different life forms and the cells of numerous different life forms, um, including single-celled organisms. So um, <clears throat> now this describes, in, in, further into the article here, they, they describe how previous research has isolated bacteriophages. All right, so, so let's just let's look at this one sentence. They say, as a step towards better understanding the diversity and biology of phages and their hosts in Halo Alkaline Lake Elementita, phages were isolated from sediments and overlying water using indigenous bacteria as hosts. Um, so there you have it. They, they used bacteria as hosts. So they cultured the the viruses in bacteria, they used culture. So does this support the claim that culture, the use of culture is not a proper method for isolating viruses? No, actually it demonstrates just the opposite. Now, obviously the use of bacteria for bacteriophages makes sense because bacteriophages are viruses that infect bacteria. When you're talking about in viruses that infect animals or humans, well then you need to use animal or human cells. Um, which is what they do, you know, they, uh, and they use typically, for example, viral monkey kidney cells uh, from the viral uh, line of, of cells um, because, you know, that they have, uh, <laughs> because primates are, have a lot in common with humans, and so this is a widely used, um, readily available uh, cell line that, that scientists can use for isolation of viruses by using cell culture. So we can see from the, their first cited source that actually it contradicts their central claim um, because the scientists in this case actually did that their method of isolation was the use of culture. They cultured the bacteriophages in bacterial cells. Um, <clears throat> and so it's not true that they didn't mix it with any other products, okay? But, but here again, they're saying that this is the proper way to do it. We can see that the proper way to do it, according to their own source, is the use of culture. All right, let's move on to the next paragraph. Um, and I'll read the whole thing here. I've highlighted a few 
portions. Uh, these identical particles are then checked for uniformity by physical and or microscopic techniques. Once the purity is determined, the particles may be further characterized. This would include examining the structure, morphology, and chemical composition of the particles. Next, their genetic makeup is characterized by extracting the genetic material directly from the purified particles and using genetic sequencing techniques such as Sanger sequencing that have been around for decades. Then one does an analysis to confirm that these uniform particles are exogenous outside in origin, as a virus is conceptualized to be, and not the normal breakdown products of dead and dying tissues. And they have another end note there, footnote. And then they say in parentheses, as of May 2020, we know that virologists have no way to determine whether the particles they're seeing are viruses or just normal breakdown products of dead and dying tissues. And then they have another, the third and final footnote. So they have three so sources in total that they cite to support their claims and arguments and their position. We've already seen how the first one actually contradicts their central premise that the proper way to isolate a virus does not involve the use of culture. Um, so let's see what the other sources say. So here, um, note that they acknowledge the validity of whole genome sequencing. So they refer to Sanger sequencing, which, which is a method of sequencing the whole genome of uh, a virus or a microorganism. So they're acknowledging the validity of that. Uh, and yet, as I've covered in uh, both a prior article and in prior video, uh, they deny the existence essentially of, um, of what's known as metagenomic sequencing, which enables scientists to simultaneously sequence the, the whole genomes of multiple microorganisms in parallel directly from a patient sample without first isolating each microorganism. Um, so this, this technology exists. It poses a ma major obstacle to their argument because they're claiming that, well, it hasn't been isolated, and yet, you, you know, the, the whole genome sequencing of the virus is by itself, is independently, in, independently from the isolation of the virus is proof of the existence of the virus. Um, and so their response to the existence of this technology is to dis dismiss it and pretend as though it doesn't exi exist and isn't capable and scientists don't have that capability. Um, so I've, I've covered that previously so you can review my, my prior content if you'd like to learn more about that. So I just wanted to make that point again here about how they acknowledge that, that, uh, that the validity and existence of whole genome sequencing technology, um, but then they, they can't actually deal with that in, in their argumentation. Um, <clears throat> so anyways, moving on, the, the, the specific thing that they cite um, the second reference for is, you know, that they're making this, essentially they're implying that scientists aren't finding viruses, they're finding um, normal breakdown products of dead and dying tissues. So they cite the second article, um, which is titled, uh, Extracellular Vesicles Derived from ap Apoptotic Cells, so when, when cells... Um, cell death that occurs, um, an essential link between death and regeneration. So it's talking about extracellular vesicles um, such as exosomes and, and their role um, in apoptosis, apoptosis uh, in cell death. Um, so essentially, you know, this, art, this, this citation um, is meant to establish that, yeah, there's a normal breakdown uh, of dead and dying tissues and there are products such as exosomes um, from that process uh, and exosomes do have similarities to viruses i think that's what they're trying to imply with that um, that citation but really all that citation demonstrates is that yeah uh, you know there's um, <laughs> uh, there are such a thing as exosomes and you know there, there is you know, normal breakdown products of dead and dying tissues um, but then they make this third claim that goes hand in hand with that second source. They say that we uh, virologists have no way to determine whether the particles they're seeing are viruses or just normal breakdown products of dead and dying tissue. So they're suggesting that um, it's just extracellular vesicles and it's not viruses. Um, so here again, let's turn to the third source that they use to support that claim. Um, it's this source, uh, April 30th, uh, actually published May 22nd, 2020. Uh, the title is The Role of Extracellular Vesicles as, ally as Allies of HIV, HCV, 
and SARS viruses. So right there, right in the title of the paper, we can see that um, this paper does not support their claim that viruses don't exist. It does not support their claim that scientists can't tell the difference between viruses and exosomes. Um, and, and he, just to take a closer look at how this paper actually, again, once again, contradicts their claims, um, it, it describes, you know, uh, extracellular vesicles, including exosomes, um, which, um, you know, uh, essentially my understanding of exosomes is that one of their important functions is, is they serve as messengers. They can carry um, genetic material. Um, it's actually been shown with SARS-CoV-2, uh, I'm sorry, with the, um, with the COVID-19 vaccines, the mRNA COVID-19 vaccines, that the spike protein, uh, uh, that the vaccines cause these cells to produce is actually taken up by exosomes and carried throughout the body. Um, so that's an example of, uh, you know, what uh, a function that exosomes can have that actually this article discusses. Uh, in fact, right here in the abstract, they, they point out it discuss SARS viruses, which, of course, referring to the original uh, SARS coronavirus, uh, as well as SARS-like viruses. So viruses in, in the you know in the same species um, that are, excuse me, capable of, uh, of binding with the ACE2 receptor are, are known as SARS-like viruses. So uh, the SARS viruses. They write are a new entry in the world of EVs studies. Uh, again, EVs is um, extracellular vesicles, including exosomes, um, but are equally important in this historical framework. A thorough knowledge of the involvement of the EVs and in viral infections could be helpful for the development of new therapeutic strategies to counteract different pathogens. So you can see right from the abstract, you don't even have to read very far into this article that they're not saying that scientists have no way to tell the difference between viruses and extracellular vesicles. Um, so what, what Kaufman and Cohen at all have done is essentially cherry pick um, from this paper and I can just scroll down and and he, here's what they like to if, if they actually provide in notice in their statement on virus isolation they don't provide a direct quote but I have seen them elsewhere in videos or someplace I've seen them um, pull this quote out that I've underlined here in red uh, and they and they, they they pull this quote they said it says nowadays it is an almost impossible mission to separate EVs and viruses by means of canonical vesicle isolation methods such as differential ultracentrifugation because they are frequently co-pelleted due to their similar dimension. Uh, and they, they might also quote this, to date a reliable method that can actually guarantee a complete separation does not exist. Okay, so, uh, you know, this is true. This, this, it is difficult to separate, you know, when you're talking about like purifying a virus or isolating a virus, it is, um, it is difficult to and by the way, purification and isolation are two different things. Purification is a step in the process of isolating a virus. So they're not synonymous as, um, you know, Kaufman and Cowan commonly seem to use those terms synonymously, um, but they don't mean the same thing. So purification, for example, is a step that would come before the inoculation of cell culture. So they would take a patient sample and then uh, filtrate it or centrifuge it um, to purify the sample, to separate the virus from like the host cells and other materials in the sample. And then they would take that supernatant, um, you know, this after centrifugation, they take the supernatant containing the virus particles, and that's what they use to inoculate the cell culture. So purification is a step that comes before the cell culture in the process of isolation. Uh, and, it, it, you know, it's true as they, it, cause they explained that it, because exosomes, you know, they can be of a similar size, they can have similar properties, uh, to, to viruses, and therefore it can be very difficult to, to separate them. Um, and so, uh, you know, that, that's, that's true. But notice they're not saying, well, that therefore we don't know whether we can't tell the difference between viruses and, and exosomes, and viruses might not even exist because maybe it's just, it's just um, extracellular vesicles. Um, they're not saying that at all. Uh, and we can see how this has been, how Kaufman and Cohen take this out of context um, just kept by kind of running through the study um, and seeing how they don't deny that scientists can distinguish between the two. They, they can, and which is, of course, they do in this paper. They distinguish between extracellular vesicles and viruses, which is the claim that Kaufman and Cohen are, Cohen are supporting, uh, uh, citing this paper to support, that, that scientists can't tell the difference. 
and therefore they don't know whether viruses exist. And yet you read their own cited source and it explains how scientists can tell the difference and they do distinguish between the two. And how, uh, in fact, <clears throat> they show how scientists understand how viruses can actually use, um, they utilize exosomes. Um, <clears throat> and there's a, uh, here, there's a, I mean, just further, it's past here. And there's a diagram here that I want to show you. So here is a diagram. Okay, figure one here shows EVs are vehicles for the communication between infected and uninfected cells. During viral infections, virus enters cells and exploits the ves uh, vesicular biogenesis, uh, biogenesis machinery to release EVs, microvesicles, and exosomes with a modified composition to favor its own pathogenesis. EVs can carry A, entire viral particles, B, different viral proteins such as the envelope ones, C, nucleic acids including viral genomes, microRNAs, and small non-coding RNAs, and D, host cell proteins whose production is induced by the virus. So yeah, scientists can distinguish between viruses and exosomes and they can observe how, like for example, in the case um, uh, of SARS-CoV-2 and the COVID-19 vaccines that are designed to induce the cells to generate the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2, how that spike protein induced by vaccination is actually picked up and, uh, and carried by exosomes and circulates throughout the body. Uh, and this diagram is an, an example. It's, it's, it's an illustration of a virus um, using exosomes to be transported into uh, to other cells where it can then infect the other cells. So yes, this paper supports uh, the opposite of what Cowan and Kaufman are claiming it supports. It, it shows that yes, scientists can distinguish between viruses and exosomes, um, you know, despite it being difficult to actually separate the two with centrifugation or, or other purification methods. Um, and so, you know, once again, we see that the source that they cite to support their claim actually contradicts their claim. And in fact, they talk specifically, again, about coronaviruses. So coronaviruses belong to a large family of enveloped RNA viruses uh, involved in various respiratory syndromes. The name coronavirus derives from their characteristic electron microscopy appearance. They have a typical round fringe that recalls the solar corona, which surrounds a spherical envelop enveloped particle containing the positive single-stranded RNA genome. Okay, uh, here highlighted in red, all COVs, coronaviruses, are characterized by a common set of structural proteins, the nucleocapsid, the spike, the membrane, and the envelope proteins. And I, I just highlighted that because again, um, it's, you know, there's that example of the paper showing how the spike protein induced by vaccines is actually um, picked up by exosomes and, and carried, carried throughout the body. Um, and of course, they acknowledge the existence of SARS-CoV-2, severe acute respiratory syndrome, syndrome coronavirus 2. Um, so here again, point being, they're citing a paper, you know, because they, they want to, they want to, um, they're, they're making authoritative claims. And so, you know, to create the illusion of having authority. They're, they're, they're attempting to derive authority from the sources they cite. They're making a claim, they're citing a, support, a, a source that ostensibly supports that claim. So they're deriving their authority from these sources and yet we can see, uh, and they cite three, so we can see that the first one actually contradicts their claim um, by showing that according to them the proper way to isolate a virus is through the use of culture. In the cases of bacteriophages, bacterial culture, in the case of uh, animal viruses, animal cells. Um, so that's contradicted by their by their source. And then in the second case, the, the, the second source cited is is really neutral. It just all it all it does establishes is that yeah, there's there is a process of normal breakdown. You know, there's products of a normal breakdown of dead and dying tissues. Yeah, nobody's going to dispute that. Um, that's that's all that establishes. So that doesn't do anything to favor their argument. Um, and then the, the third, the third study that they cite in conjunction with the second, claiming that scientists um, can't tell the difference between viruses and exosomes, um, which of course they're implying that what what scientists are seeing 
what they're actually finding is not a virus, it's an exosome. Um, so we can see that the, the, this, this source that they cite to support that claim actually contradicts it as well. Um, and so scientists do have the means of, of distinguishing and, and they can distinguish in, in, uh, between exosomes and other extracellular vesicles and viruses as shown in the paper. Um, the, the paper, again, they're, they're denying the existence of SARS-CoV-2. Again, the paper acknowledges the existence of SARS-CoV-2. It confirms that, the, that this virus exists. So we can see they can't even cite uh, a single study from the scientific literature to support their claims. And so, you know, this authority that they are implicitly claiming to have that's derived from the sources they cite, in other words, they're not making an authoritative statement here. They're, they're speaking nonsense. They're making false claims. And they're citing sources to support those claims that actually contradict those claims. Um, so, and, and, but then notice, you know, if we have come, they say they continue after, after, after doing that, they continue, they say, if we have come this far, then we have fully isolated, characterized, and genetically sequenced and exogenous virus particles. So, of course, if we actually look at what the sources say, so yeah, if we've done the cell culture, you know, we've gone through the process, you've taken the, the patient sample, you've purified, purified it, you've inoculated salt cell culture with the use of a, an un, un, um, uninfected control um, cell line. Uh, and then you can further characterize it. You can view it with electron microscopy. You know, you can do whole genome sequencing. <laughs> um, and of course, all of this has been done. This is all documented in the scientific literature. Uh, there are databases, international databases, where scientists from all over the world have independently isolated and whole genome sequenced SARS-CoV-2. Um, and you can use this, these databases to actually map out the phylogenetic tree uh, of the, the virus. Um, showing its ancestral um, path, its evolutionary path, um, based on the mutations that occur as it passages through the human population. Um, this has all been done. It's all documented. It's all in the scientific literature. And so their entire argument depends on um, dismissing literally the entire body of relevant scientific literature. They can't cite a single source, as demonstrated here, they can't cite a single source that actually supports their claims. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the sources they cite here actually contradict their claims. And, and again, looking at what the sources actually say, that once that's done, yeah, we have fully isolated, characterized, and genetically sequenced and exogenous virus particles. So um, not by their claims, but by what their own sources say, yes, that has been done. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 has been um, isolated and characterized and whole genome sequenced. Um, so that, that's that. I mean, that's that's sufficient to completely debunk their statement on virus isolation and demonstrate how they're deceiving people. Uh, they're not being honest. Um, they're they're taking statements. Sometimes they cite papers, but they take statements out of context, uh, and they mischaracterize the the, the 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 sources that they cite, as clearly demonstrated here.